So good morning. I'm delighted that you could join our panel session today on multiculturalism in businesses and communities in Newfoundland and Labrador. It's one of a number of panels, as you know, taking place during the Association of New Canadians <laughs> Virtual Diversity Summit 2020, promoting multiculturalism and anti-racism in businesses and communities in Newfoundland and Labrador. I'd like to begin by recognizing the ANC and Rogers for two things, really, leading and making available this platform for what are very important conversations on diversity and anti-racism. <clears throat> And number two, for promoting multiculturalism in businesses and communities in our province. The research is clear, diversity and inclusion in all its forms, including multiculturalism, contribute to innovation, contributes to enrichment and productivity to our workplaces, to our workforces, our businesses and our communities. My name is Sharon McLennan, and I'm the director of the Newfoundland and Labrador Workforce Innovation Center at the College of the North Atlantic, and I'll be your moderator for today's panel. Uh, NL WIC, as we, we have come to be known, uh, has a provincial mandate to collaboratively identify, share, and promote the testing of ideas and innovation in workforce development that will positively contribute and have an impact on employment, employability, and entrepreneurship. And that includes broadening the whole talent pool uh, and participation of underrepresented groups in our province's labor market. So that's why I'm very excited to be here with you today. So over the next 45 minutes, uh, we will have four panelists uh, who will bring significant and diverse experiences, insights and perspectives into multiculturalism and businesses and communities into our province or in our province. I will begin by asking each panelist to introduce themselves and their organization or affiliation. After that, I'll ask a series of questions in exploring diversity, inclusion, and the role played by and the impact on or of multiculturalism in our businesses and communities. So let's begin with your introductions, uh, panelists. So perhaps we could start with Pam. Sure thing. So my name is Pam Anski. I am the executive director of the St. John's Farmers Market Cooperative. Nice to see you. And uh, next we'll go to, uh, to Tony, but if you could introduce yourself. Yeah, Tony Pham, I'm a professor and Stephen Jaros Lawson Chair of Patrick Economic Transformation at Memorial University. I uh, led a team that is dedicated to research in uh, immigration, uh, inclusion, and diversity in the province and beyond. Excellent. Nice to see you again, Tony. Loidetta, if you could introduce yourself, please. Hi. Hello, I'm Loidetta Queco, and I'm the founder and uh, CEO of Sharing Our Cultures Incorporated. Excellent. Nice to see you. And finally, Colin, could you introduce Hi, yourself, I'm, please? I'm Colin Kalicki. I'm the Regional Vice President for RBC Rural Bank uh, here in Newfoundland, Labrador. Excellent. Nice to see you again as well, uh, Colin. I think I've had the good opportunity not to meet everyone in, in great detail, but I've, met, I've been introduced to all of you, so it's such a pleasure. So why don't we just jump right into that? Thank you so much. So my first question is directed at those who run organizations at maybe starting with you, Pam, and then we'll move to Loidetta and then to Colin. So what does diversity and multiculturalism mean to you and your organization, uh, Pam? Well, for us, diversity is really a, a core tenet of, of our foundation and fundamental philosophies. Um, it's written into our business plan. It's written into everything that we have. Um, the market really strives to not just include people, but to create a place where everybody truly belongs. And so everyone has, you know, equal voice. Everyone has the opportunity to contribute. Everyone is a valued part of our community. And it's one of the things that we've worked very hard on over the years. And, and we want to, we want to be able to be as welcoming and as, you know, we want people to be able to feel comfortable here, no matter where they come from or how long they've been in this city. Um, so that's that's one of the things that we strive for very much. Thank you, Pam. And Lodetta, maybe you could answer that question for us. What does diversity and multiculturalism mean to you and your organization? Okay, thank you. Uh, well, both concepts are interrelated for us because our mandate for sharing our cultures is to promote the values of multiculturalism and intercultural relations within a bilingual and multicultural Canadian society. It means it's our responsibility to ensure 
intentional transformational engagement with our community on issues related to diversity and inclusion. And of course, we do this through our programs and events uh, for engaging um, high school youth to enroll in the program and they get an opportunity uh, to share their cultures with the public as well as with grade six students. So we bring in uh, teachers, bring in grade six students and they interact with these students from diverse cultural backgrounds, which includes both indigenous and francophone and local uh, communities as well. So this is really what we do. We've been doing that for a long time and it's, uh, it's very important to us because it's very, but I, I'd like to say it's the DNA of our organization. Yes, that's, that's a good way to put that. Uh, Colin, what about uh, you and RBC and your organization? What does multiculturalism mean for RBC and you? Uh, thank you, Sharon. Uh, so what I'll do is start with uh, our definition, actually, which, which is where at RBC, we believe that uh, diversity and inclusion is really a state of being valued, respected and involved. Mm -hmm. And it's about how do you focus on the needs of every individual to ensure that like the right conditions are in place for everyone to achieve his or her potential. So I often say diversity is the mix, but inclusion is getting the mix to work well together. Yes. And so yeah. for us, it means respect for uh, appreciation of differences such as uh, gender, ethnicity, age, national origin, indigenous status, sexual <laughs> orientation or gender expression, etc. Yes. So we, we've always believed that the that uh, embracing diversity is and multiculturalism is not just the right thing to do, but the smart thing to do. Yeah. Is it does have direct impact back on uh, our talent, people that we hire, yes. um, our clients, and our community. So it's really embedded in the fabric of all that we do. Yeah, it's very much so. It's it's I referenced uh, broadening the talent pool, and it's so important, isn't it? All of those underrepresented groups, and we need to do it. It's the right thing, but and but we need to do it, and, and it, it'll enrich all of us if we do. So, uh, Tony, uh, as the uh, Stephen Jarolowski uh, uh, Chair in Cultural and uh, Economic Transformation, how can immigration and diversity enhance our economy? Well, that's a big question, of course, and a that's uh, what we yes. do at Memorial University. Uh, we welcome uh, all three thousand international students, but also uh, newcomers from all around the world. Uh, we also doing uh, research to actually inform uh, policymakers and our general public about the social economic benefits of immigration and cultural diversity. And as we know, uh, you know the our population uh, is not growing as fast as we had hoped. Actually is one of the only provinces that experienced public in decline uh, in the last uh, few years. Uh, so uh, first of all, immigration certainly would help uh, us to grow population. Uh, they help I also, by definition, uh, the economy, uh, economy as well, by filling labor skill shortages. Uh, based on the recent survey uh, of more than 300 employers in the, pro in the province, of course, it's funded by NLWIC, so I have to, you know, um, yeah. really want to show my appreciation to the support. And more than 43% employer in the problem reported uh, harm difficulties. And uh, many of them tend to tend to uh, newcomers, international students for help. And also, um, as uh, you know, um, Royal Bank and many other organizations know really well, and immigrant newcomers also contribute to uh, job creation, actually, through mostly consumption, but also investment, for example, buying houses, right, and uh, invest in stock market and so on and so forth. And still, some of the newcomers are more unequal uh, to start a business, okay, not only creating job for themselves, but also for uh, local residents. As, as you know, international students are three times more likely to start a business than a local resident. And first of all, as we know, uh, our population is Asian. We need more also young, energetic uh, employees and taxpayers uh, to support our healthcare system and the social security system as well. Finally, Canada and the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. We are a trading nation and trading province, right? Yes. We export a lot of our products, natural resources, oil, gas. We have the fish products, agriculture products we're talking about here, and, uh, um, you know, mining products, iron ore, and you name it. 
So uh, international migration really helped us build those kind of trading relationship and broaden our international market. So yes. really, I think, you know, um, immigration can do a lot of social economic benefit to the problem. Also make this province a lot more interesting. Just think about different kind of Africa foods, right? We talk about it here, different kind of culture, music, festivals, and so on and so forth. And yes. uh, yeah, and you know, by definition, we bring in all these immigrant newcomers uh, to fill our skill labor shortages, not to compete with local residents. That's by definition. And yeah. our study shows exactly the case. We need a lot of professionals in high tax sectors, also people in the technical trades, occupations, and even most skilled occupations uh, for which that many re local residents are not willing to uh, fulfill. So basically, yes. a lot to say about immigration and diversity. <laughs> in the Thank you so much, Tony, for that. Uh, so back to you, Colin. Um, can you walk us through walk us through a little bit with more, maybe a little bit more detail about how diversity and multiculturalism are celebrated and embraced at RBC? Uh, sure, Sharon. Thank you. Um, uh, very similar to how Pam started. It's embedded in all that we do, um, and there there's a number of impacts. So first of all, uh, it's part of our values. It's part of the core. You know. Our mission here is is what we call how do we help clients thrive and communities prosper. You know, Tony yeah. talked about you know what newcomers to Canada and newcomers to Newfoundland Labrador bring to our province, and so we want to make sure that we're strengthening strengthening the fabric of the community. Um, but I'll, I'll I'll go into a couple of key areas. Uh, number one is our employees. So we want to make sure that we've got diverse, inclusive workspaces. Uh, you want everyone to reach their full potential. And what I found and what we found across the country is that a diverse and a multicultural team usually brings out the best in all of us. Diversity of thought and experience and background, it just adds so much more, especially as we want to make sure that we are um, the, the face of our community. Absolutely. Uh, and of course, the, the, the demographic of who, who we are as a province and as a nation uh, it's different province by province and city by city, but we really want to make sure that we are recruiting individuals, that we are developing individuals uh, that are from diverse backgrounds, because ultimately it makes us stronger and ultimately it makes the province stronger as well. From an employee perspective, we also have a lot of established routines and, and uh, I'll say efforts such as our employee resource groups. So we've got specialized teams inside of Newfoundland and right across the country uh, that focus on uh, what well, one's called Mosaic, which is focusing on newcomers to Canada, which is uh, an area that allows our newcomers inside of RBC to meet one another and network and bond better, but also allows uh, other employees to understand more of the culture as well. We have similar teams for say, uh, what we call Royal Eagles, which would be for uh, those that identify as indigenous, for example. Um, also pride for the LGBTQ2 community, for example. Um, but we also engage in our community. So how we represent, where do we go, advice events, community events, everything from Chinese associations to Friends of India. Like we want to make sure that we are supporting um, financially and by visibility um, many areas of our community and I've been in this province now for uh, four and a half years and I'll say the the efforts and um, the routines that were in place before I arrived because I've got employees that want to be part of the fabric of the community so for, for me it's part of employee retention um, as I'm helping to build a more Diverse workforce. I will say yes. while we've done some work, we have still a lot of room to cover and a long yes. road to go. But overall, it, it just makes for a better workforce, um, a more appreciative and more dynamic workforce. And then it also lends itself to, I'll say, volunteers. So we also have a lot of our employees that spend a lot of time out in the community just volunteering their time. And again, RBC really supports this uh, uh, back to um, back to the 
community. And I'll just end on a final point of recruitment. Um, it's in the fabric of what we do. Um, I've had a number of conversations, even with Association of New Canadians and a variety of other individuals across the province to try and make sure that we are representing. So at the end of the day, it's, it's embedded right into our values. It's, uh, and it has a big impact on our people, on our clients and our communities. Excellent. Thanks so much, Colin, for that uh, perspective and insight. So uh, Pam, back to you. Uh, the, the, Saint, the Saint John's Farmers Market has seen tremendous growth in recent years, especially from immigrant vendors. How has this diverse mix of food and arts enhanced the market and our community as a whole? It is the most awesome thing ever. I'm just going to start by saying that. Um, we have vendors from more than 20 different communities, 20 different countries at the market. And we are delighted to welcome people from all over the world to be able to, to showcase what they bring to this city. So, and I think the entire thing is a win for everybody because what the St. John's Farmer's Market has become is a reflection of the new face of St. John's, the, the new cultural diversity of St. John's. And, and we really wanna highlight and celebrate that because it brings so much to this city and so much to this province. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of different ways that that, that happens. And I just wanna kind of skim through a few of them, but for the market itself, you know, it, it allows people to come and explore new and interesting things, things that they might never have had exposure to before. And it's really neat to see somebody who has never been able to be in an environment where they can get, I don't know, curry or jerk chicken or whatever it is, and be really hesitant at first because they've never been exposed to it, try it and absolutely love it. And it just gives a sense of familiarity to that. And, and people keep coming back for those reasons to explore the new things that they can find. The other side of it is that for a lot of people, all of the diversity <coughs> in the market is a familiarity thing. So we have so many people in this city from many different countries around the world, and they come to the market and they find someone cooking food from their home and the, the smells and the aromas and the flavors of their home country. And that is an incredibly poignant and, and meaningful thing for us because we want people to feel like they are a part of our community and, and a celebrated part of our community. The other piece of it that a lot of times we don't think about all that much is that a lot of the folks that move here from other countries can be really challenging to find a community at first. It can be really challenging to find their place in the business world at first, especially if people are coming under, you know, not so great circumstances as refugee status, mm -hmm. things like that. But what we provide here is an opportunity for people to develop their small business to be able to come here to find their, their customer base, their, their niche in the market without having to invest in a whole bunch of overhead, without having to go out and rent a building, without having to do all of those things, and without a lot of the bureaucratic process that might be involved in starting up a freestanding free business. Not only that, they find a support system. So we will help people walk them through all of the different steps they need to do from food licensing to, you know, safety training to all of those things. And, and we are there the whole time. And after they get here, they also have the support of the other vendors. So we have a, a community of people who are from all over the world who are very much willing and eager to help folks who are new to the market really find their place at the market. And so we, we have become a really um, supportive community as such, where not only for folks who come to buy and to explore, but for the vendors themselves to find their niche within this city where they might have been a little bit isolated before because they didn't really know too many people. So all of those things kind of combine together 
to be able to create this wonderful, you know, amalgam of, of diversity and richness that we're very, very proud of and we're very excited to keep going with. Wonderful story. Thank you so much, Pam, for that. Uh, Tony, it's back to you now. Um, and again, you did touch on the your current research around employers' perceptions around mm -hmm. hiring immigrants and newcomers and international students. Uh, but wondering if uh, how much and um, have employers been talking about or highlighted the benefits of hiring newcomers? Has that is it too early on to be able to talk to that, or what could you speak about in in your in your current research, either with NLWIC, which we have funded, or maybe some of your other research about the benefits of of newcomers? Yeah, I mean, you know, this uh, Canada, you know, as uh, you know, uh, Colin Pan Oedal mentioned, uh, you know, Canada is a, is a country of immigration, right? You know. Uh, we actually rank number one by OECD as the best country for immigrant uh, settlement integration. So we're proud of that, right? One of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, ideas said as an immigrant myself, you know, uh, every time when I arrive in uh, Toronto Pearson International Airport or St. John's International Airport, I really have a sense of coming home. So that sense of belonging is really important, right? Mm -hmm. And that is, the reason why uh, we have the kind of feeling rather than, you know, we we, we feel that home country is, is, is our hometown uh, is because, you know, we have this multi-sectoral model of uh, integration and settlement. So, you know, not only the government, right, uh, is involved in the selection process, but also, you know, the settlement agency like ANC play very key role for the early settlement integration, but also employers now come up and uh, fulfill their responsibility. Uh, I mean, just, uh, you know, giving one idea is that uh, the federal government uh, recently initiated this uh, uh, Atlantic Immigration Pilot Program, right, which uh, give a lot of responsibility uh, to both employer, okay, and also the settlement agencies uh, to help to develop a settlement integration plan. So uh, that's the reason why we need to, um, to find out to the perceptions and attitudes of uh, uh, employer, uh, you know, um, towards hiring uh, newcomers, international students, because from uh, studies over study, the most important determinant for long-term integration and retention of newcomers, international students, is meaningful employment opportunity, right? Yes. And uh, so that's the reason why we, we, you know, general support from NLWSC, we conducted a survey uh, in uh, 2019, you know, very fresh actually, um, and uh, about 300, uh, you know, uh, employers within the problem respond to our survey. And among them, 6% of the organization received application for newcomers and international students, and 48% of them actually hired them, which is way higher than, uh, you know, the percentage reported by uh, Professor Waylock Scott Lynch in 2005. I think the attitudes of employer has become more positive. And the reason for that positive attitude is because they realize the benefits of hiring uh, immigrants and international students. For example, uh, for the steel labor shortage, 40% of the employee reported uh, the most uh, you know, common occupations that uh, they need more workers are professionals, you know, high tech uh, services, for example, technical trades, and uh, you know, for which actually employers have hard time to find local workers in the field those kind of positions, and uh, actually very passively, according to the survey, among those employers who actually hired newcomer international students, more than 80% of them have positive, you know, uh, you know, positive experience, okay? And uh, that is very encouraging, like IBC, like a farmer's market, right? Like, uh, you know, the cultural center right here, and uh, why? This is a question we also talk a little bit more. Why they have such positive experience? Uh, most important reason uh, is actually strong work ethic of newcomers. They are really hardworking, okay? 55% of employees reported, 
okay, followed by strong qualification and skills, sometimes very hard to find skills, right? And uh, willingness to learn and reliability, okay? You think about this uh, from an organizational perspective, right? Those employees with strong motivation, strong work ethic, combined with high qualification skills are most productive, right? That's the reason why the employees look at them, okay? And would like to try more. You know, looking at this data also kind of interesting, not only looking in the past, 48% of the employer high in newcomers, international students, but for those actually uh, looking in the future, right? And um, uh, even more, in the next five years, 79%, and among those already high the new, uh, newcomers, 91% uh, of them plan to hire them again. So, so basically, you know, this actually really dispel some of the myths, you know, uh, about, uh, you know, uh, newcomers taking job, you know, away from the local residents and so on. This is actually, there's no evidence whatsoever, you know, from the national study, also from our local study here, right? And uh, the reason why, you know, the employers are so eager to hire newcomers internationally because, number one, they couldn't find that high-level qualification skill. The second is that, you know, sometimes they couldn't find uh, those local uh, workers to fill the position. They're not willing to fill. Okay, so let two kind of situations. Uh, so what do we find? The high level professional technical trades and also lower skill in production. So really, I think this survey, yes. although it's still early on, but, you know, demonstrate a lot of, you know, positive uh, social economic benefits uh, to employers, but also to the Newfoundland economy. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, so, Loidetta, I'd love to hear a bit more about your 20th anniversary. That's quite a milestone. So, last year, Sharing a Culture celebrated that amazing milestone. And what have you learned from the growth and uh, success of your organization that you could share with us? <laughs> Um, thank you very much. Well, we've learned a lot over the years. Primarily, we've learned that collaboration is the key. So China Cultures collaborates with all three levels of government, academic institutions, organizations, ethnocultural communities. Uh, we have representatives who serve on our board of directors and the various advisory committees. Because we feel that we all have a role to play in making our schools and communities a welcoming and accepting of diversity. Communities where every child is included, so as we work together towards that common goal. I think um, our young people also contribute to the growth and success of our programs and events and projects. They have great ideas and positive energy. Um, mm -hmm. We have a post-secondary youth advisory committee and they are amazing at what they're able to achieve. Uh, it's just great to watch them join their meetings and observe how well they organize activities for the high school youth. Um, we had a project with the schools for multicultural classroom activities where we go into the grade six class and we deliver presentations on diversity because we feel that that's a great age uh, where we can actually engage them uh, in discussions and helping them with their worldview of diversity and inclusion. And we've seen a lot of our post-secondary international youth uh, go into those classrooms and the experiential knowledge, and uh, they've received great reviews uh, from the teachers. For our grade six uh, students as well, we uh, publish cultural context. So cultural context is a collection of stories, poems, drawings by grade six students about their cultures. And this is distributed throughout the province. So each student will get a copy of cultural context uh, to take home. So our goal there is actually to stimulate positive conversations about cultural diversity in the classroom because the teachers use it as a source as well and the students take it home and they have those conversations because we feel that if we're going to build positive um, attitudes uh, towards diversity that we really needed to start with that age group that uh, grade level because they are also exploring world cultures but they don't always get an opportunity to interact with the cultures with which they are mm -hmm. learning so this gives them that opportunity to interact and learn from the high school students. And of course, these high school students are learning skills. We meet with them, they um, enroll in the program in September. And we meet with them every week. 
and then we'll have about four uh, skills development workshops throughout the year. So they learn public speaking skills, they learn project management. You know, they've got come up with a theme. How am I going to put this all together so I can present it either at the rooms in March or uh, as we have expanded to the other parts of the province as well. So we have the same programs that's run by local students and communities in Happy Valley, Goose Bay, Grand Falls, Windsor, uh, you know, Corner Brook. So these are areas in which we feel that we have learned so much just by the collaboration piece. Because when we go into the communities and we, you know, talk with uh, whether they're school administrators or community organizations, and uh, they just embrace the program and the event because a number of these um, communities have been increasing in their population of newcomers. So they have a diversity even within their own communities. So to be able to assist them in in recognizing that these um, communities, these uh, newcomers who come, uh, have, uh, bring a lot to, to their community so that our newcomers could be recognized and valued. And they can also have an inter in opportunity to interact with locals as well. And they're learning for each other. That's the great thing uh, about sharing our cultures is that we've learned that uh, the new cultures can learn from the established cultures and the local cultures. And together, they have an opportunity to build you know, their community and to feel that sense of belonging and acceptance in the community. So, you know, I feel that we've really learned over the years that, you know, collaboration, getting connected with the community and giving young people a platform or space for their voices uh, to be heard and recognized and valued makes for a great successful uh, organization and program. That's a wonderful way to summarize uh, so many of the benefits. Um, and uh, I will end with if to see if anyone wants to add anything, but I just quickly to say uh, what I've heard in a very short period of time, but a very rich period of time, thank you. There's lots of benefits, social, economic, community, culture, um, uh, employment. Uh, I mean, there's so much. Uh, it takes, I love the word intentionality. I think, uh, Lodetta, I think you used it at the beginning. I love that word, but it, it, takes, it takes a few things. It takes collaboration. I believe that, and I've heard that. It takes, uh, you know, uh, connections. It takes a shared vision and shared goals, doesn't it? It takes, it needs skills and education and training. It, it, and it starts young, but there's a role for everyone, isn't it? But I do feel that there's, within this diverse set of uh, perspectives and insights, uh, you represent uh, a wonderful face and, and stories about, uh, I think, the, the, the uh, positive future um, uh, as we move forward around diversity and inclusion and multiculturalism. And I just want to say thank you so much from my point of view. Um, I want to ask before we finish, uh, if there's anything, one top thing you'd like to make sure you say or anything that you'd add in terms of promoting multiculturalism. Uh, just something and, quick. Uh, one second, okay, no, uh, Colin and then, yeah, then Tony. Uh, from a historical perspective, right, uh, from the inception of multiculturalism in the 1980s, you know, this policy has moved beyond on employment equity to, you know, share the citizen, citizenship to, um, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, the more community engagement and so on. You know, this is actually from uh, employee perspective. I think it's more voluntary, right? You know, equity is legal requirements. Uh, diversity is something we celebrate because it can actually enhance organizational uh, objective. Right, so multiculturalism is actually being becoming a national symbol because we win a lot of uh, support from the general public. Look at uh, the most recent uh, uh, public opinion survey, 2017. Multiculturalism yes. was actually ranked number two as national symbol ahead of hockey, right? And uh, you might be wondering which one is number one. Of course, Maple Leaf. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if Colin, you can top that or not. But you, I think you had your hand up as well. What else would you like to, you know, to finish? Any additional thoughts? Yeah, I'll just say uh, I'm I'm really intrigued uh, by all my panelists here, like Dada, Tony, and Pam for sure. Because and and, yeah. I, and I find it's interesting that we're we're also talking about you and yes. the value yes. that youth have in this process, particularly for our province. And when Lodetta was talking about the Youth Advisory Committee that's yes. in place, I mean, 
it's it's something that uh, I'm looking forward to having more discussions about because ultimately yeah. this is about how do you really help a province thrive? How do you go forward? Diversity is a strength. Um, I can speak as an employer that uh, when I do hire newcomers to Canada, it's a wonderful experience. And I have newcomers in pretty much uh, the majority of my 19 locations across the province. Certainly some more in St. John's, but not exclusive. Um, I just think it's really refreshing to be hearing the, um, the aligned views, particularly youth-based, collaborative-based. Yes. And I yes. think more of these conversations are definitely needed for our province. Yeah, I love yeah, I love that idea about youth, and I think we should continue that conversation. And that could be a subject of a really wonderful uh, webinar. So stay tuned. Maybe I'll consult on that with you. Uh, so uh, so uh, yeah, Lodetta, and then Pam. I think you had okay. your hand up. Yes, final I was words. Say, final words. Yes, uh, someone has said that diversity is being invited to a party, and inclusion yeah. is the <laughs> answer to dance. But I'm going yes. one level further uh, by saying. That inclusion is being asked to choose the songs that you dance. Oh, ah, oh, wonderful! Thank you. I, I heard the first two. I never heard that last one. So thank well, you. Well, I just that. made that up. <laughs> Very good. I love it. Creating on demand. Uh, so, uh, Pam, before we finish, uh, final words or thoughts? I do, and well, mine's a final story, I guess, a final anecdote. So I, I had someone um, come to me a. a back in, well, before we closed down, so back in February or March, and he said, whenever I feel homesick, I come to the market because I can always find a little slice of home there, but I also mm. feel seen there, and I also feel respected there. And, and I think creating that community for all newcomers is such a vital piece of it, is creating a place where people do feel seen and heard. And, and that was just one of the most touching things that I, I could ever have heard from somebody about this market. So yeah, and I, yeah, that's, that's my story, but it's, it speaks to the importance of creating a place for newcomers in this city and in this province. That is a place where they can feel seen and heard for everywhere. Yeah, it's, it's, it's common for all of us too, is it not? Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to thank uh, again all of you as panelists today, uh, participants uh, at the uh, Virtual Diversity Summit. Uh, congratulations again to the ANC for your leadership on that. And to Rogers for making this accessible. Uh, so important, all those factors go together to make successful and wonderful things happen. So thank you all very much. Mm -hmm.